All right, peace, family, peace. This your brother, Tad, of the OG Wisdom Podcast. I want to thank y'all for joining us. Thank you for the little late uh, entry. However, we're waiting for our guest to pull up shortly. We got our brother, C. Gutter, joining us in a hot minute. Also, our brother, in Bay and Shangi, author, community activist, and a brother who has done a lot of great works within the community. One of his uh, early books that he wrote is Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People. All right. This is a must have in your repertoire. So get that book. We also have some other things that we're going to be working on, but I want to get our brothers in here. Uh, pull them up shortly. In fact, give me one second. I got one brother trying to come in now. Uh, we got our brother in Bay Bay about to pull up shortly backstage. But I definitely want to thank y'all for tuning in. This is the relaunch of the OG Wisdom Podcast. Many people have known they have caught us in the past. And um, now we just relaunch. And we got a lot of information, a lot of things we want to share with the community. A lot of things we have planned, big things we have planned. So I want to thank y'all for tuning in as we wait for more people to join in. Shout out to my sister, Kay Fighter, my sister, Keisha Forrester. You can catch us together every Thursday on Thorough Black Talk, where we talk about current events, community events, and politics, things that affect us as a community. All right. So with that going on, in fact, in fact, I'm going to try something real quick. I want y'all to bear with me because I am not a tech person. I am a person who can sit and talk, talk about current events, talk about books that I've read, all that good stuff. So give me one second. Give me one second while we're in the studio waiting for our folks to pull up. Again, you can follow us on the OG Wisdom Podcast on Instagram, where we talk with our brother C. Gutter. C. Gutter is one of the people from Junior Mafia. He has a lot of connections within the industry in terms of hip hop and R&B. You know, Gutter is um, a certified OG. Many people know who he is. Many people may not know who he is. And um, he's very conscious, an African-centered brother who um, has done his time for mistakes made in the past, but now he's back out free with a whole new mindset. Actually, it's his original mindset, but he has grown and developed into this warrior that we now recognize as Balagoon. Balagoon is his clothing line that's also Balagoon is also a Yoruba term for a general or war chief. And our brother is a warrior. So shortly, our brother uh, C. Gutter will be joining us. But right now, we have our brother in Bay Ishanki. Uh, brother in Bay, how you doing, brother? Salute, General. How are you, man? I'm um, blessed and highly favored, brother. I'm glad you could join us today yeah, on man. the OG Wisdom Podcast. Yes, sir. You know. How you feeling, bro? Man, I'm feeling I'm feeling blessed, man. Every day that you have an opportunity to breathe and get up with no pain, uh, you know, physically, uh, and you can, you know, chart your day. That's all a blessing. So I, I'm, I'm giving thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to thank you for joining me earlier. Before we got online, we were backstage. We was talking about community leadership and um, just the direction we're heading as a community. Let the people know who is in Boy Being Shanti. I talked about your book a little bit. I gave reference to a pot to piss in, you know, the uh, intergenerational planning for black people. Um, talk about where you started in this journey on consciousness and educating the people and where you are now. Wow. OK, so <laughs> it's got to go way back to the 90s. Um, I would say I was, man, I was a junior in college uh, at the University of Pittsburgh and uh, KRS-One came to my school to do a lecture. Um, I thought he was coming to perform, but he actually was, the teacher was really going to teach, you know, and I almost didn't go. But uh, that lecture changed my life because at the time I was, you know, I was 21. I was trying to figure out what I want to do with my life in regards to just figuring out, you know, things. And at the time I was um, under the guise of religion, you know what I'm saying? Thinking that was what I was supposed to do and be. And he came and he, his lecture was called Revolution of the Mind. 
and that lecture, he just basically the the one thing that really stuck with me was because I was a an aspiring Bible thumper at the time, you know. <laughs> that he he talked about um when you open up the Bible and you look at the first pages, you'll see that it says re-edited version. And he says, so what does that mean? Who has the power to edit the word of God? And he just literally pulled the rug from right under me. And I went back to my dorm and, uh, you know, had to do some some questioning about my 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 programming. <laughs> and it was that night that I actually symbolically breaking my uh, my 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 bondage or uh yeah connection to being taught instead of being able to teach myself or be able to question what i'm taught put my bible in the trash and the next morning i went on this journey where i was i was uh literally sequestered by several people from different religions and that got me into the era of you know dr york and five percent nation and, and then finally got home with marcus garvey um and learning about being african-centered your dr Benz, dr john henry clark's Chancellor Williams, etc. So it's been a journey uh, started in 1990, 1991. Um, learning that though, my goal was I've always been a person that loves to share. So I didn't want to keep this to myself. And I realized that, you know, people don't have time to sit there and listen to you talk. So I said, well, I got to do the one thing, the next best thing. And that's right. So I started writing. Um, regardless of the fact that my college professors told me that I would get F's, I wouldn't, I should never be a writer. I, I got F's and D's in writing in college. <laughs> wow. But, but I decided I wanted to speak our story and um, started the Ghetto Times Magazine in 1993, April, April 10th, we're in our 31st year. And uh, this has just been a publication now, mainly website based that is covering the uh, issues that have been chauffeured by global white supremacy, misinformation, um, and we cover all areas of the nine areas of people activity, really 10 um, with economics, labor, um, economics, education, entertainment, labor law, politics, sex, religion and war and health. And we cover those 10 areas because that is the blueprint that uh, so-called global white dependence, not supremacists, they're depending on us and our ignorance to convey this, uh, to keep this thing going. Um, so that's and that's the. That's the genesis of who I am, um, involving, evolving, having worked for the National Basketball Association for 12 years um, and then having my uh, job taken away from me because of what I post on social media about our story and the reclamation of it. That was when I had the first first encounter of understanding I need to learn about money uh, because that is the crux of everything. We spend our lives working for it, but have the least awareness about it. So that's what prompted me to uh, create the Crypto Woke Financial Sustainability Movement, which prompted me then to write, you know, this book, uh, A Pot to Piss In. And in this endeavor, it's also, you know, I'm also a historian. So I wrote this book also, Who is a Boule, uh, which, you know, talks about those vanguards that have been uh, responsible for our delay and our liberation, the ones that went against Garvey. We don't talk about that enough. So. That is my whole thing is understanding that our story must be known, um, you know, good and bad. And so that we can make assessments about how we can stop making the same mistakes over and over again, because it's 2024. And although we have a robust spending power, we're still 99 percent consumer, 1 percent producer. We're still in the same position. We still have the crap, um, uh, crap, barrel, crap in the barrel mentality. Uh, and we still are also suffering from post-traumatic uh, state syndrome. So we are still fighting these things, yet we'll still here, we'll, we're still here. So the goal is to up that ante so that the next generation has an opportunity uh, to make it better. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it's supposed to get better, not worse. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you took it back to 1991, the level of consciousness you had back then. Now, I know our brother C. Gutter, salute to C. Gutter in the house. Please. Bless up, bless up. In the early 90s, 1991, I speak for myself. I was still on Fulton Street, ripping and running, trying to figure it out. Gutter, 1991, what was that like for you back then that led you to this level of consciousness you have now? 1991? I was in prison in 1991. Okay. I, I, came, I came home in, 90, in, in 91 as well. But, um, yeah, I was, I was, it's, 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 it's odd because I was like deep into the streets and because I was in jail. So I was deep into the, the, 
the street thing. But at the same time, I was also deep into because I was I was I, I had um joined the nation of gods and herbs um in ninety. You know what I mean? From just learning just because um my parents, both of my parents were, were Pan Africanists. So and I have an African name, which is Balogun. So um you know, just that upbringing just pushed me that, but I was like 10 toes down in the streets. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm learning, you know, I'm learning the history and all of that, but at the same time, I'm with all the negative shit. You understand what I'm saying? So like I was, but I was deeply, deeply into studying. Cause that's one thing about me. I always like to read anyway, like no matter what we was doing in the streets, I didn't like, I would always pick up something to read. Cause that been my thing since I was young anyway. So I was always reading anyway. So once people pointed me to the books to read, instead of just picking up any kind of information, cause that's what I was doing before. I was I was able to take in a lot of information because but a lot of it was frivolous. But when I started taking the information that truly mattered for us, then it got deeper. You know what I'm saying? Then I wanted to learn more and more and more. Like you said, the uh, um Dr. Benz and the and, and the John Henry Clark and the, I think I started with Chancellor Williams. No, actually I started with um Brother gave me message to the black man. That's the first mm-hmm. First, that's the first joint I got, and I was on Rikers Island then. I think I was in um, OBCC at the time. I was young, you know. Like I said, I was young. I'm into all the negative stuff, so you can imagine, you know, I'm trying to take people commissary. I'm trying to snatch people chains in the hallway, stuff like that. I'm doing, you know, like I said, I was deeply involved in that, you know, and if you're involved in the streets, when you get to jail, you're going to be deeply involved in whatever going on in jail. Uh, yeah, because there's still criminal activity going on in there. But at the same time, like when I had that time not doing that, I was basically playing ball, working out and reading. Now, it wasn't what? like you doing that shit every day, all day. You right. know what I'm saying it's just you like, downtown. The moment, yeah, when the moment present itself, you know you do you, you do whatever you do. You know what I mean? Why you why you in um why we was in the buildings? Now I asked that question, right, Gutter, brother and boy, because here we are, three black men who truly care about our community. But I think the '90s was a pivotal time for us, like it was for our elders in the '60s. I remember in the 90s, the elders would always talk about the 60s because we had Dr. Clark. We had Dr. Ben, Professor Browders. We had these master teachers, Kaba, Kaba Kamene. You know, we have them right now in our midst. But I can remember hearing elders back in the 90s talk about walking with Malcolm, talking about uh, marching with Dr. King and how important yeah. that was to them. So i am be honest with you, I was kind of jealous of the 60s back in the 90s. Yeah. But yeah. then as we, as hindsight is always 2020. I was, I was I was jealous and like for some idiotic ring is kind of dismissive of 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 certain because I didn't realize like you don't realize the danger they was in. Right. And I was like, yo, y'all wasn't busting their head, or blah blah blah, and you don't understand the context <laughs> it was in. It's yeah. like, nah, it ain't it ain't like it is in my era. Like the young dudes, really, like the young dudes look at us, be like, man, y'all y'all, y'all would. I was like homie you don't understand it's like certain things happen in my era that y'all can't do right and gutters that's that's why i was going that's why i brought the 90s up because i want to bring this up to where we are now and how we move forward in the future before we sign out with this right so the whole thing i was bringing up that level of consciousness because in the 90s we didn't 19 1990 1991 we didn't realize the value of the 90s of what we had because there was a a huge paradigm shift when we look back in the 90s, because and then in the 60s, you just had an awakeness of um just not taking it. It was more so about laws, 
a little bit about culture, but more about laws. But in the 90s, we realized the value in change, not just changing laws, but creating a whole new reality by embracing our own African culture. So even within the music, even within television, you had the um the the, the creation of Moshud. Remember Fulton Street, downtown Brooklyn. Remember, you had Bogolan from seven corners almost down to Flatbush Extension, where it was all black businesses. Yeah, with, that was that was, that was, that was and then when you go past Franklin Avenue. Right, mm -hmm. I'm talking about past Franklin Avenue. Right, Bedford Avenue. You mm -hmm. had the Muslims at the mosque, yeah. Bedford and Fulton. Shout out to the brothers over there. Yeah. So there was a whole new level of consciousness arising in the '90s. But just like you, gutter, you know, we were in the streets. Gutter's a few years older than me, so he was in the the, the street grade above me. You know, I was with the group coming up behind Gutter. You know, mm -hmm. what I'm saying so he was an OG in the streets in my class. But there was a consciousness shift that was going on that we didn't realize the value that was happening at the time. But the 90s gave us some dope teachers. It really opened our eyes to the to the Dr. Khalid Muhammad's, to the uh, Barishangus, who we, mm -hmm. we um, got so it's familiar with, who, who gave us African people and European holidays. Dr. Clark was still alive. We still had Dr. Ben in our midst. We had the United African Movement down on Fulton and Bedford at the Slave Theater, bringing in all the heavy hitters. Now, this is the 90s. We still had Kwame Ture. All of these people in our midst at the time, unfortunately, some of us were still looking back, back at the 60s, but the 90s was a very, very pivotal point that brought us to where we are today. And a lot of us miss, especially like individuals like me, miss opportunities. Yes to be in they miss to like move away from what we was doing quicker than we ended up doing. Yes. It was a lot of dudes that was in the streets that was conscious. Yeah, yeah. I know it's an oxymoron, but no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that, that was just it. They, 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 we were conscious to a degree. Mm -hmm. we, right. just, we, we just knew, we just knew who we were we were proud of that. We knew we knew our history to a degree, but we didn't understand the full um magnitude. The full range, yeah, the full magnitude of everything. Who we are and what's yeah, like, like, like we, we didn't understand, understand what we was doing was understand. well, we knew it was negative because we knew we knew more more through the law, through knowing like if we get caught. This is what we, you know what I'm saying? But we right. wasn't understanding. Quality of life policies. Yeah, we, we wasn't understanding the impact it was having on our community as a whole. Right. And you now, because now real real quick, Gunner, because I want to give it back to Mbwebe to bring him up, because I definitely want to talk about you being in the streets. I'm going to give it to Mbwebe, but this point I want to make, Gutter, because I want you to jump in this after Mbwebe. Because in the 90s, you along with me was seeing the development of one of the greatest hip artists, hip hop artists ever alive, arguably the best that ever did it. Back in the nineties, our brother wasn't big yet. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody knew who he was yet. Cause we're still trying to figure it out in the nineties. Our brother, I, I mean, I came, remember I came home, I came home the end of 91. So I was home from November to March. Cause I went right back to jail. Like I asked. Yeah. So, brother and boy, man, while you was in school fighting, fighting the um, misinformation about who we are as African people in the United States, what was that climate like fighting this ignorance in school of white folks? And then at the same time, looking at the ignorance of what's going on in our communities with the um, with the drug epidemic going on and the intentional misinformation in the early 90s about who we were because that's when we also saw gangster rap really take a hold on our folks and you were in school with educated kids who all of a sudden became gangster right. what was your thought process back then you know the thing the thing that i that, that uh really used to um i it, i gotta realize that they say from boys to men you know what i mean it's like even in coming in self-awareness about yourself um it was done in such a rebellious way because you realize, damn, I've been lied to. So everything is, you know, you're mad at everything, you know what I mean? And so, but at the same time, 
not understanding the full spectrum of it because we're thinking uh, we personalize it like, OK, this is happening in my life, not realizing, yo, this is not not 500 years. This is 6000 years of colonialism. You know what I'm saying? So we don't understand the magnitude of how deep this deeply rooted this thing is. So we go in thinking I got the solution because that was my mindset. Like <laughs> maybe y'all ain't never read this before me. And when you read it, you go like, yo, just you go feel like how I feel like, yo. I'm I'm done with this, and I'm gonna go ahead and and and, and go on this plane, um, not realizing that. And I say this a lot now: the Harriet Tubman complex is 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 part of our DNA. And what I mean by that is Harriet Tubman said that she would have saved thousands more, if not hundreds, if not thousands more of slaves if they knew that they were slaves. So, me trying to learn as I'm going, learn and share as I'm going. Because I'm like, I'm getting it and I'm giving it. I'm getting it and I'm giving it because I'm like, yo, this is so, to me, it was like an epiphany of awareness. And I was like, I can reclaim myself for the first time. I, I can stand on my own knowing who I am and knowing that I'm in a space where the world sees me in a different kind of way. And I need to make my people know, be aware of that. You know what I'm saying? We all know there's a hint of something, is it right? But now I can tell you specifically what why things are messed up. And who's behind it? I can name the names, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, when you're doing that, you start to realize that it's not on the higher, higher echelon of a lot of people. They're not interested. I've had people tell me, I've even said it before. I'm not interested in that black shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like people don't because they're trying to get there. They're trying to establish themselves or whatever. And so that was, that was the, the uphill battle of understanding that Global wide dependency did a great job at creating examples of what happens if you try to stand up for yourself. I mean, they imprison folks. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they dismantle, they infiltrate. So we have that distrust amongst each other. Then we're also still fighting each other because we want to be black. We want to be Negro. We want to be nigger. We want to be African. Now we want to be Moors. We want to be, we want to be all these things fighting each Negros, other opposed to the fact that look. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like who's, who's responsible for creating all of this? Who's responsible for creating all this nonsense? You know what I'm saying? Like, even today, like, we still, people are still beefing about if you say black, well, okay, I understand black is not a place. I know that, but you're trying to speak to the masses. If I say African, you'd be like, no, nah, I ain't African. Exactly. And so I got to say, oh, I ain't black. Okay, if I say brown, no, I'm not Latino. So, you know what I mean? Oh, oh. We, try to, we try to figure out what, what do you want to be identified as? You're going to offend somebody. Exactly. Exactly. However, you say if you say it black, if you say you black, the Hebrews and the Moors are gonna get mad. Bum. You say you African, they are gonna get mad again. Bum. Um, the the, the colored the indigenous <laughs> Americans, which I, I don't understand because there's only one place people were ever indigenous to. That's Africa. Right. And, and 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 even that. Everybody like, else, we travel. I tell, I tell to. folks. I tell folks. Regardless, if you say we were here before slavery, I agree with that. However, when you go back to the the if you want to go back to the very first people, the oldest bones, when you talk about Pangea, when you talk about, you know, people are so afraid to talk about the top. And this is what Asa Hillier always says when you study history, study it in its chronological order. Give me the damn dates. If you can't give me dates, and if you talk throw the Bible at me, that's what KRS once said is the Genesis, Genesis in the beginning, that's not a date. In the beginning is not a freaking date. So you can't put that on a timeline to see what else is going on. More importantly, where were African people at that space at that time? 2024 AD, meaning 2024 years ago, zero AD, we were already doing shit. So the point is, is that there's so much dissension and that's what creates folks not wanting to take responsibility of, okay, where's my stance? Where do I see myself? What is the pivot or what is the square I stand on? Because there's so much dis disinformation because we've been misinformed. We're still suffering from that. You know what I'm saying? So it's not to say that we can't uh, get rid of that, but it's a we've been toxified. So we need to detox that. And in doing that, it takes time, bro. And I have to understand that for myself is that in the earlier years, I thought, man, I had the solution. I thought I knew it. Just follow just and not follow me, but read what I read and you'll be there. And even our authors weren't there. That's the reality, because this is not this is not a generational problem. Therefore, it is not a generational solution. 
This is multi generational. You're talking about playing chess, not checkers. Everybody, we're gotta thinking, get yeah, if we're thinking we can we can solve this in one generation. Nah, man, that's, that's not the way it works. You know, if you're looking at the bigger spectrum of it, of it all, it's a much bigger and deeper plan. So therefore, you need to start thinking bigger. You need to start thinking intergenerationally. How can I pass this information to the next generation? That's where we need to be at. That's that's just my mindset about it. So, Gutter, what was your mindset like? All right, early nineties. You're in prison. You're reading these books. You come home because I know you was back and forth. But for our audience who may not know how often you were back and forth, what was the transition like for you coming out from prison? One of your best friends is now got a record deal. He's about to blow up. We've been new. Big was nice. We've been new. Biggie was nice. You know this stuff, but now here's the contradiction because the whole hood is on some street type of time. You was in prison. You're reading. You'll understand that this is a plan designed by our open ops. But here it is. This this whole thing is about to feed you, your family, the crew. And at the same time, you're growing into the lessons your parents instilled in you. How was that for you? I still was I still was um, fully embracing um, negativity at the time. Like, so you knew better. Though you knew better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I was like I was literally what 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 the gods would call the devil. Mm. Cause the devil know what he's doing. I was on bullshit. Tad, you know, like it's just to tell. And I, I all I could do is be honest. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like I knew better. I would too, I would I would even talk to the to the to the young homies and all that, and like yo. You know where we from, uh, 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 this, that, and the third. But because I, I, I also was dealing with a temper problem too, as well. My temper was like very real quick, bad. gutter. Real quick, gutter. Because we're talking about street stuff, but I want to know what was your hustle of choice in the streets? My hustle of choice. How did you get your money? Um, like I did, I did a little bit of everything, but mostly um, stick ups. Like I would do, I would, I would get money off of stick ups. So you would tell the young dudes, I would, I would, give book, young dudes I would book knowledge. something and then hustle. You know what I mean? So let me ask you, Gutter, you would give young dudes knowledge, but then just turn around, spin the block, and stick something up. Yeah. All right. I just, I just wanted to put that on the table. Yeah. Man. Pretty much. Yeah. Like I, I would be, you know, because I was big on history. And I was big on um, because my, like that was one of my favorite subjects in school. I read a lot anyway, so um, you know I was big on that. So with that in mind, like if one of the little homies bring up some or one of the homies, period, it ain't have to be a, a young, a little homie, it was a, a homie that was around my age. If he brought up something in that arena. Then I start going in. But I didn't really tell you, like another thing, Tad, that you know that people not, I ain't really talk a, a much outside of that. At all. You know what I'm saying? I ain't really do a, a, a lot of talking outside of that. Outside of cracking jokes on people, you know what I'm saying? Or we having a, a deep conversation. You know what I'm saying? I could talk about, um, I would have a conversation about sports, which I was the only dude that was in the sports in my crew like that big wasn't in the sports not playing like he watched it but he didn't play he didn't play he played ball when i went to the park and he'll come in there and we'll be in there late night playing bullshitting around but he wasn't in the sports rock wasn't really in the sports cheek wasn't cheek was the only other one that played ball but not to the degree that i did so we didn't have those conversations you know what I'm saying? I would put Big up on certain people like, yo, nah, he nice. Because Big asked me, but we didn't have basketball conversations. You, you dig what I'm saying? We didn't have football conversations or anything like that. But everything was about just about the streets. and Because I'm be honest with you, brother and boy, but as long as I knew Gutter, Gutter used to be real quiet. I mean, he still is like that. You know, he talked when he comfortable. But he was this old school Brooklyn we talking about. So his eyes was moving. You could see his brain thinking. And he was definitely silent. But I, I brought I bringing this up, right? Just to give a, a background, a context of who we are as black men on this panel. 
talking about problems. And as we close out, we definitely going to talk about solutions. But in leadership, brother and boy, babe, you wrote a book about the boule. A lot of people like to throw that word around right now. First time I heard heard about <laughs> first time I heard that word was by our ancestor Steve Coakley. Right. Mm -hmm. Please be upon. Him. Tell the people who the boule are and how they function. And are they good or bad for the community? So when you when you do the definition, um, you look up the definition of boule, it, it's defined as advisors to the king. Now, you then need to look up the word advisor because some people think, oh, you give advice to the king. No, there's another advisor definition means you take uh, you take instruction from the king, which is what this advisor means. And so the boule is the oldest black organization uh, uh, in America. Uh, and it was founded before, although it's a fraternity, it's, it predates outside of Prince Hall Masons. Uh, it predates, you know, your NAACPs, Urban Leagues, uh, Jack and Jill's, uh, you know, all those. And in fact, those are subsidiaries of the Boulay. That's their recruiting cesspool that they pull from, right? So we have fraternities, sororities, et cetera. But the Boulay comprises of, as ancestor um, Steve Coakley uh, in 1990 came out and really, you know, guns blazing about this information about the spook against us. You know what I'm saying? Like the black face that infiltrated uh, our greatest organizations, be it the Black Panther movement, be it the Marcus Garvey UNI, UNIA movement. Um, these are, this is the movement of men comprised of 3,000 of the most established men on in, in America and abroad. There are some in the Caribbean as well. Chapters is that these men come to get, came, the or, originators of the Boule was founded by six doctors out of Philadelphia. May 15th, 1904, when they were incorporated. And uh, these men uh, basically wanted to resurrect the second chapter, their tenets or their practices of skull and bones. Skull and bones, if you're not familiar with who skull and bones is, is the second chapter of the Illuminati, the first chapter being Phi Beta Kappa, who was outed in 1776. Um, and they went underground and resurfaced in 1832 at Yale University as skull and bones so when you talk about skull and bones now we gotta look into the names you gotta look at your lord nathan rothschild you gotta look at um, um uh cecil rhodes you gotta look at john d rockefeller who is not a born man but a made man um, we're looking at these elite international bankers who are responsible for global white dependency and now you got these negroes that want to come and resurrect this chapter meaning that we want to be the ones that get the table scraps um, and we'll keep the Negroes in line for you. So when we look at that history, we find that the Boulay is responsible for their for the Tuskegee experiment. The doctors wow. that injected the syphilis were members of the Boulay under the direction of R.R. R. Moton once they got rid of, or I would say even probably killed, uh, Booker T. Washington. Um, and, and Tuskegee was the first and really only HSBC because all the other ones are named after white uh supremacists white uh <laughs> um <laughs> slaveholders etc these are institutions of higher training higher they say learning but it's really higher training and so we found that our entire and, and the reason why let me just say this too the reason why the boule was founded was because you have to think about this is that from we were emancipated in 1865 right so we're emancipated but now they have, we're, so that means we're free to go and learn. And, you know, the last thing you want to do is to have Negroes read because if they read then they can start to learn the language and then they can actually see themselves as more than just domestic. They can see themselves as, you know, around the entire globe. So they had to harness the type of information we be, have access to. So that's why they created these HSBCs, these institutions that allegedly are black own, ran or owned and they're not. And but it's the experience of being black. Right. But. You know, Spellman is named after John D. Rockefeller's wife. People don't even know that. That Spellman is John D. Rockefeller's wife, not this black woman named whoever named Spellman. So these institutions are important because this is where this new generation that is now no longer in physical bondage now can learn and read, but we want to harness and make sure what they are exposed to. And we do not want them to think about Africa in a good light. 
So that's why we have the boule in place to make us want to stay domestic. You have WD, du, WB Du Bois, who was against Garvey, was against Booker T. Washington. And although they only talk about the latter years, the last three years of Marcus of um, WB Du Bois, because he became a so-called Pan-Africanist moving over to Ghana and dying there because he wanted to work on the Encyclopedia Africana, he was still an agent. He mm -hmm. never gave up who he worked for. He never gave up the names because that's under their pledge. They're not supposed to tell you in their logo. It's a lion with a hand over a vase inside the vase of the names of those who run the world. And they promised to never tell those people. So did Carter G. Woodson. Same thing. He wrote Miseducation of, of the Negro. Although he put it in code, they never told you the name. So if someone killed your moms and I just kept telling you they killed your mom, you're like, who's they? Give me the exact name. That's what they did. They gave us, you know, breadcrumbs of who it possibly can be purposely yeah purposely designed for us to never catch who it is so we got to think about where we are in 2024 and why we're still in the same situation socioeconomically culturally we still are the entertainers of the world but none of the owners of the world and a lot of that becomes comes down to the fact that the boule is responsible for us investing in their education opposed to becoming African centered and knowing who you are globally. That's in the summation of it. It's a, it's a, it's a whole bunch of other things that we could look into and I've, I've covered in the book as well, but our history, our story has been uh, dripped to us <laughs> with a lot of white sugar, white flour and, and white folk. We just had to understand that. You know, it's funny you say that I've been to Ghana and I've been to, um, W.B. Du Bois gravesite. In fact, it's uh, the W.B. Du Bois Center of African-American mm -hmm. Studies and things like that. I'm glad you brought that up because even when here in D.C., when you go to the Smithsonian Museum as well, when you start, because, you know, you're supposed to start from the basement and move yeah. up. I yeah. came from Africa. A couple mm -hmm. of months later, I was in the museum and I'm just looking at this distorted history because mm -hmm. in the museum, a lot of props were given to uh, the Europeans for being yep. quote unquote abolitionists and things of that nature, you know, and everything was sports and entertainment, not mm -hmm. too much of who our freedom fighters was. I think they had um, Nat Turner's Bible, Harriet Tubman's gun, um, our little brother um, um, got murdered in Money, Money, Mississippi. I mean, oh, Emmett, Emmett, Till? Emmett Till, right? Yeah, they had his casket, mm -hmm. a little fluffy. Because yeah. we understand our story. It's a lot different yeah. than what we see in the Great Blacks and Wax Museum down in the basement. If you ever go there, you'll That's get a right. full story. How do we identify who is the boule? Because a lot of our folks are following these leaders who haven't been tried or true, but mm -hmm. somehow they get a microphone and a camera on them, and people think that these are our spokesperson. How do we how do we ask them? You made it. You made a good point earlier about um, everyone's throwing that word out there, right? Because they're saying LeBron James is, is boule. First of all, there's prerequisites to be in a boule. First of all, you have to be at least 45 years old. You hmm. have to already have been accomplished. Okay, see that they don't. They're not recruiting people with potential. You have to already have been accomplished, and you must be a doctor, lawyer, politician, etc. You must be part of the divine. Well, not divine nine, because that's including sororities, but you must be the part of the divine four, the fraternities, Alpha Phi Alpha, Omega Psi Phi, Phi Beta Sigma, Kappa Alpha Psi, and, and maybe Iota the Phi Theta. But you need to be part of a fraternity first. OK, and so those are the prerequisites to, to be in the boule. Now, that's not to say that, you know, you have just like in masonry, people don't understand is that in masonry, uh, you have 33 to third degrees. However, the first third the first one through third degree you're um you thinking that you're at the highest echelon right. and is it until the 30th degree that you realize that you those 30 previous 29 degrees you've been lied to wow by then you've been indoctrinated so you've been indoctrinated so much that by the, the 33rd degree they tell you who your mother and father is and is the african man and woman yes and so now you have to pledge to keep that silent However, if you ever meet anybody that knows that and they confront you with it, you have to acknowledge it. Now, it's funny you bring that up about who your, your, your parents are, because when we talk about the Masons, we're not talking about we're not talking about just black people alone. We're talking about anybody that's part of Scottish and York. 
Because I want to, I want to peel back a couple of layers because um, fraternities. A lot of times, our folks join fraternities and say, "Well, this is from ancient Africa. This is from ancient Egypt. This is our stuff." You know, you know, and that's a whole other subject in itself. Yeah. But when yeah. you say they let you know who your mother and father is in your in, on your website, the Ghetto Times, in one of the Expo days, days you did over ten years ago. You talked about statues and images and how things are hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. On the Library of Congress, mm -hmm. they tell the story, correct? And one thing that I share with my young people, which I thought was so dope, was that um, outside outside of the U.S. Customs Office, uh, the Native American Museum down in Wall Street, yep, you shown what, what they call it—the four, four women, yeah, four the, women, the, yep. the statues. They put that imagery right there in our face. Yeah. They're already telling us, but I said, I guess you mean once you get to a certain level in Freemasonry, they're pretty much more blatant. But to the layman, such as myself, gutter, our audience, those who haven't done this research, talk about some of the images that are in plain sight, but speaks loudly about who they are and who we are in relationship mm. to our existence on this planet. Mm. Man, that that that's one of my favorite topics because um as they say, the, the the easiest way to hide something from a black person is to either put it in the book or right in your face, right in front of your nose. And so because we are not so this this is what prompted me to also get into STEAM or STEM, because I have a program that's called um from slave ships to steam ships. And I teach about how most of us think we just bar here, those of us that were brought here, because for those folks, they would get mad. I was you know, that, that conversation, but <laughs> the, the point is that uh, they brought us over here not for just for free labor. They brought us over here for our innovation. They knew that we created cities, you know, built from the from the ground up. We had underwater sewage. We had electricity. We knew about you know alchemy. We knew about botany. We knew about those areas. So that's why they valued us, right? And then they made us forget, as as uh, my Jagna Browder talks about Transition Thirteen. They made us forget, and then we forgot that we forgot that we created these things. And then they reteach us this from the white perspective that uh, that that uh, Tom Edis, Thomas, Thomas Edison created energy or electricity when we know that it was Lewis Latimer that was really behind it. And they called him the black Con Ed when they actually, or the black Edison, when it actually should be, Con Edison should be called the black Latimer. You know what I'm saying? Right. And interesting enough, the energy is company is called Con Edison because it's a con. But the yeah. point is, is that when you look at structure, when you look at, I mean, it's all around us when you look at pillars. When you you mentioned the ethnological heads of the Library of Congress, the ethnological heads talks about the origin of race. And you know, there's 33 heads, 33 masonry, and there's 33 heads surrounding the entire upper echelon of that building. And when you go around there, the front of the building are all the European different ethnicities of the Europeans, right? Facing which direction? Facing uh facing west. Mm -hmm. Right. So most people get mad because oh, that's the front of the building. Oh, yeah. They will put, put white people first. Right. The ethnological uh, origin of Africans are in the back facing. Right. Facing. That's the point. Facing east. So we're thinking that, oh, man, they put us in the back like the back of the bus with Rosa Parks. Right. When actuality, it is correct because the sun rises in the east. The origin of man, the origin of woman, the origin of knowledge comes from the east, not from the west. So they are not, they're they're being precise and saying these things. It's just that we are not aware of mathematics. Well, let's just say it's science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics. We don't know that that steam is actually should be African because that's what it is. They're taking all that from Africa. We were the ones that did all of the, I mean, uh, um, John Lafayette is the one that was able to do the layout of DC because he studied the star. I'm sorry, not Lafayette. Well, Lafayette is the one that's given credit for it. But it was Banneker. It yeah. was Benjamin Banneker. Benneker, Benneker yeah. That did the, uh, the, you know, the almanac, the, the wooden clock and whatnot. He's the one that looked in the stars because he was from Dogon. He had Dogon in his blood, even though they were like generations apart. So how was that? It, that was the innovation in this DNA. The, so I speak about that and I get excited about it because guess what? That gene is still in us. If you tap into it, you will open up and reignite that genius in us. 
But because we're told, nope, you're supposed to be part of the rat race. You're supposed to get a job. You know, get a, you're not a man unless you have a job. Uh, you're supposed to work for someone and wait for them to pay you. And when they let you go, guess what? Go find another plantation. You spend your entire 50 some odd years working for someone and you got eight years to retire. That's supposed to be living because that money has gotten in the way. We don't understand our true purpose. We were not born to live on to, to work. We weren't born to pay rent. We're the only species on this planet that has to pay to live on this planet. That has gotten in the way of who we are as in, in our genius, my true purpose. What is the dash between my birth date and my expiration date? What is that dash filled with? It's been filled with servitude and misinformation and working for someone thinking that's my value, my monetary value. So because of that, we aren't aware of what our true identity is. We're going after the wrong thing. It's a, a uh, what they say, you can work for 40 years thinking you don't get rich. You're going to still be broke. You're going to be, if not more broke in 40 years than you were when you started out because you're chasing a dollar and you don't know how to manage it. So that's why I'm also, that's why I got into finances because I'm like, look, let's deal with the finances because then when you own your time, then you can go back to your greatness of my purpose. What was I really put here for? Let me study that history. Let me go out and walk my streets and look at the names. I was talking about this the other day. Let's look at the names of our streets, the cities, the buildings, the holidays. These are named most likely after someone that has done something wrong against African people. So That's when you call their names, you are giving them homage. Mm -hmm. You are paying homage. You are resurrecting the energy of their deeds. We need to be getting to the renaming. And OK, I can't change Peter Stuyvesant because they're trying to call it what? Bef uh, Stuyvesant Heights, right? I right. can't change the history of Stuyvesant, right? Or call it Bed Stuy. But, but if I do mention it, I'm going to turn around and also mention Sheikh Adjidia or Jacques. I'm going to mention Tansela Williams. I'm going to wish, mention Francis Cress Welsing. I'm going to, on a daily basis, mention an ancestor's name, be it in my tribe or in, even in my immediate bloodline, to balance out, if not get ahead of that negative energy I just misappropriately gave when I said, oh, you know, I, I'm going to Washington, D.C., and, you know, I'm giving Washington homage in his name. I know that's, you know, semantics or whatever. It was energy city. Early, but energy works but our power. Is power to your point. Yeah, it works our power. And it's definitely a, a and now, now we get into high level con, uh, conversations <laughs> dealing with frequency and consciousness and vibration. Yes, right. yes, one right. thing I've learned years ago, there's only one sense. We were taught that there's five senses, some say six. I say there's one sense and that's the sense of touch. Light has to touch your retina to process it. Vibrations have to touch your eardrums to decipher the sounds. Mm. It's only one sense. These are just frequencies that our two eyes can't, can't see. But like our brother Black Dot, he always called it the first eye. He don't call it the third eye. He called the mind's eye the first eye. In fact, mm -hmm. I love that, that that article you did called Tom, the inner mind's eye. Yes, yes, Phenom yes. Phenom it's yes. old, but it's phenomenal. Without it. Without and, and I think a lot of people should get on that. I bring these things up, right? Because we we have high level con conversations. Gutter, when he go in, <laughs> I just be like, I just sit back and learn from Gutter because because he he's very astute with history, right? right? But I like to break things down for the layman, for the people in the streets who where Gutter and myself once were, mm -hmm. who wants to bring up their consciousness. Because um, real quick, we're in the information age, and everybody wants things instantly, mm -hmm. microwavable. We went from history to our relationship and our identity to finances. How do we make it relatable for our folks to have the proper identity to develop their finances? And, and as you said, free up your time so you could truly find your purpose. Man, I tell you that the, the, the crux of it all, man, I tell you is, and as Gutter says, like history. See, I don't just get into, oh, let me help you with your credit. Let me help you get with these, you know, you might cut some disputes. No, we go into the history of money. First of all, we were the first currency, number one. I mean, we look, we look at Wall Street. We understand that the currency first was it was the exchange of African people as currency. But when you talk about the, the history of money and you talk about Jekyll Island 1930, when the Federal Reserve note was created, the Federal Reserve, which then took away the gold from the civilians. And they could do this again as well. But when they, the international bankers came on the scene and bought America and we understand that, OK, even this all this presidency shit is bullshit. You know, Trump, Biden, 
even your local government. Why? Because let's look at this. Is there any solutions being brought? Everybody talking about it when it comes election time, but is there ever solutions brought? Absolutely not. It's a delay. And it actually makes it for the layman to think that they contributed. Oh, I voted. And yeah, I'm going to tell you, I don't vote. But the, anyone that votes, they feel like I did my part. I put in the person. Well, how can you really feel like you did your part when they told you who you could choose? You know what I'm saying? And they're only giving you two choices. You know what I'm saying? So the point is, is that it the onus is on the individual. And I'm not saying don't participate in the part. If that's your thing, cool. But that needs to be more than politics because that's we've seen it does not deliver, has not delivered. And African people in America are the only ones every 25 years that has to have the bill passed to get for us to allow us to even vote. People don't know about that. You know what I'm saying? And they're not beefing about that. So we talk about how great Obama was. Well, he didn't abolish that bill. Right. But the point I'm making is that we don't understand that the, the biggest part of um i don't want to get away from your 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 question but history is the crux when you talk about history then you look at money at a totally in a totally different way because there are people and i'm not a trump follower at all but when he said at the last uh when he was uh debating last last when he was running for the first term um, what yet 2000 whatever when he ran against hillary you ran before yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So he he um he said that uh when they said oh you don't you don't pay taxes he said because I'm smart <laughs> and he said look if you don't want me to pay taxes change the law did they change the law did they change the law he no. said they would <laughs> what so that's my point but guess what ninety nine point nine percent of the people just said ah oh, you know he's wicked no what you should have said was you know what okay what's the law let me understand what is the law what are the value of trust what can trust do that me because there's a there's a point where you make a we don't even understand it we have choices and when you you there's a choice to not make a choice which a lot of us do we don't know that we have choices so you're choosing to not make a choice therefore you fall under the uh the 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 title of you know being a government a warden of the gov of the government so we've been trying to like understand that the whole layout of the land needs to be understood that we have been lied to but in addition to that, you can actually use their laws against them legally and live the type of life that you're looking for. And then most importantly, look at yourself getting out of this country and seeing yourself as a global African. We ain't got to just do it here. Hold on. Do you still got your project outside the country? 100%. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. I want to give the mic to Gutter real quick because yes. as you was going, you sounded like Gutter yeah. just now because Gutter don't rock with no politicians. Gutter, you know, everything you said, I'm just like, all right, Gutter got to jump in on this one. Yes, all right. Yes, all right. I've heard that. Um, from I ain't gonna lie. I hate both sides. <laughs> yeah. All right. Literally. Because, you know I mean? like, all, like, we invest so much. And when, when you think about it, we are the swing votes for either side. Yeah. So they both of them pandered to us to fuck us around mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I like, I can't stand politicians. Yeah, because like I said, you done said everything Gutter would say. Because I everything you yeah, said, like, I, 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 you know. Um Bro, because it's 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 none of them. They you they all working for a corporation. Yeah. Look at look, I give you a perfect example. Look at what what's happening in in in, in Palestine and Israel. Well, which is Palestine? I ain't even mm -hmm. gonna say it's, mm -hmm. it's Israel because they took people land. But just just look at that. Anybody that spoke out about it, that um. The, the 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 lobby spent millions of dollars to back anybody that go against them. Mm -hmm. So that tell you who's in control of everything. It's corporations, bro. Mm -hmm. They control everything. So you voting for a corporation, and their hands are and their hands are um, at the main source of re of resources. Like I just learned that Israel, their number one uh uh export is, or the number one g g uh what is it gross national gmp but it ain't something they produce is diamonds 
but there are no diamond mines in Israel. So where are the diamond mines? They're in Africa. Yeah. So all of this is about uh, ownership of resources, land and own and resources. And now we see that you know Asians are moving into Africa. I mean, this could be an this is a global conversation. It isn't just yes. what's happening here in America, and that's the problem. Yeah, no. If we're yeah. we're we're focused on America and not realizing that you know this is something because I always and I'll, and I'll I'll digress is that um, America is the only place that has military bases in other countries. Are there any military bases on American soil from another country? Hell no. No, no. no. Sarate. <laughs> <laughs> I like that Sarate. So dealing with leadership and moving forward. Do you think there's a crisis in our leadership in our community? Yes and no. And how do we move forward with whatever your um, answer is? Me or gutter? You, you. Brother okay. Uh, until we appoint our own leadership, there is no leadership. Right. The leaders that we have are ones they give us. Um, and I think the onus is on us because it's easy just to say, well, we, when they give us what we want, well, what do you want? Like, you know, didn't the Black Panthers have a list of what they need and their needs and wants? Ten point you know, that is, yeah, exactly. So that needs to be resurrected. That, okay, what is it that we're looking for? Because I look at it like this. I equate, I equate our leadership should be just like how sports leagues are, right? Back in the 70s, you were a coach. You coached your entire life. You know, Chuck Noll was a coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers for, what, 25, 30 years, whether they won or not. Nowadays, if you have a, a winning, you could be hired. What this happened in the Milwaukee Bucks, and not that I'm a sports fan, I used to be, but the Milwaukee Bucks fired their coach, what, a quarter into the season? And then they replaced, replaced them. You know what I'm saying? So the point is that they want you to win now. So we need to have that same mentality of where are the victories? You know, yeah, Jesse, we ain't heard from Jesse in a long time because I know he's sick um, he, and he's old. But all of, you know, our Al Sharptons, our, all of those guys have moved on. So whoever is the so-called next batch of leaders that we're supposed to have, that's supposed to be a black face for us, you know, <laughs> we need to be holding them under a microscope. Where are the victories? And more importantly, we need to be figuring out what is it that we want? What are our demands? So, because for, for the, and that's good for the audience, the Jessies, the Isles, the Crumps, because we know better. Shows we spoke about the Boulets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So excluding them in the African centered community, what does leadership look like? Me, myself, I'm kind of critical of leadership, not all leadership. However, I do see there's a crisis within our African centered movement. There's a crisis yeah. in leadership there. How do we identify the good ones from the bad ones? And why is it that our leaders don't come together anymore. Within the African centered community, if we all say we share the same ideology and have the same goal. I think we need to stop looking at history as a, a money grab or as a hustle. Um, a lot of folks that are doing, you know, either be it writing books, doing lectures, whatever, you know, they're, they're that's how they earn their living, right? Um, I think the issue is that we should move away from seeing the disbursement and sharing of our story as a, as as a as a job or as a as a a way to earn income because because there's money behind it then we're competitive with each other which means I don't want to work with this person because he could compete he could you know take away some of my likes follows you know whatever opportunities so that's again where finances comes in and because you don't we're we're under the mindset that in order to create wealth or to create even sustainability it has to be given to you from someone else meaning if it's not a boss then it's going to be me trying to pack a room full of, of of an audience to come and listen to me speak and they're paying me twenty dollars a head that's how i'm going to earn my living well the actual way of earning living by you know those that understand it is that you employ your money to work for you when you are able to put in a system that employs your money meaning passive income coming and in, you know meaning you're being paid on whatever stickler basis be it weekly daily whatever that you can now do this work out of out of your passion and not out of competition 
So I think the biggest problem for us, even with our elders, and I've said this a long time ago, is, you know, I saw the examples of Dr. Clark, even, you know, recently Dr. Ben, who had to <laughs> take all his works and it was given to the nation of Islam, which I think, you know, there's a lot of suppression of his works there. But the point is that we have been under the mindset that, well, I'm sorry, we've been under the practice of not creating outside wealth out of what we're doing. So if I do a gig and I get 10 G's from it, um, I should be putting that into something that is going to now work for me so that maybe I won't have to keep doing talks to get people to pay me $20 to listen to me talk for three hours. Maybe now I can take those funds and put it towards, you know, a garden co uh, project or, you know, a housing development project or something that is going to be philanthropic philanthropic to uh, employ ourselves in a space where we're not doing for ourselves. But again, if money is the motive, then everyone's a comp competitor. Every You're looking at everybody's competition. So that's why even in the African-centered space, some of our elders don't get along with each other because they hating on each other on the low. And that's, you know, I want to say it's natural, but maybe it's, it's natural with a mind, if you have a, a Western mindset. And so I'm not saying none of us are purely cleansed of that. You know what I'm saying? But if this is the way you eat, then you're going to be defensive. Yeah. You're not going to have anything else set in place. So that's where we need to start thinking about. Well, finances to me is so critical for every living being on this planet because you need to get away from the mindset of thinking that someone has to give you something in exchange for time for you to sustain yourself. The rich don't live, Warren Buffett don't live that way. And if we just do a little bit of, they have a saying, if you're not learning about finances five hours a week, you're being irresponsible. Wow. So aside from folks reading your book, what are some other books you suggest or people you think they should get more information from? And I want you to talk about your crypto space as well. Yeah, you mean in the in realms of, of of finances or in culture? Yeah, and and, and, and reference to finances, particularly particularly um black authors, black economists. Yeah, Julian black. Gordon is a Julian Gordon man. That's that's brother man. I, I love that brother. His works. He's a he's a great brother. He's got um, um what is it called? Rituals. He has a book out. Uh, he does he does real estate, but he has a wealth of information in finances. Um, and you know I've I've re 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 read the works of uh Robert L. Um, Robert in Robert Nelson, um, often we can say um, Claude Anderson has written books about and talks about. Uh, there's George Fraser, he talks about finances and the importance of it from a culture. He's an African centered brother. Um, so the, the, there are those out there. I don't. I mean, I, there there's not as as many as I would like to to find. And then some of those that I have found come across. There's a hustle behind it, so I'm kind of like, eh. You know what I'm saying? But like for me, my goal is to try to fill in what I'm I'm wanting. Yes. You know what, I'm what I what I'm not seeing. And what I'm not seeing enough is people lining up the history with the finances. Because to me, when you once you get the history, that's the foundation. Now you're motivated. So when you do come into a bag, you don't forget why you're doing what you're doing. A lot of people, you can help them bring it out, bring them out of debt, raise their credit score. They get more credit. What do they do? They go buy more shit and they end up right back where they were. But if you entitle them with the information about how this is set up to fail and you, you teach them things like velocity banking strategies and infinite banking concepts, then you understand, wait a minute, this is going to live beyond me. Like, how can I use permanent life insurance to create wealth beyond myself and I can loan from it and not get taxed on it? Like, how does that work? You know what I mean? When we start to understand that component, then we're operating in a from a perspective of intergenerational wealth planning, where now my youth and their youth and 70 years into the future are set up in a way where they can say you know, they don't have to ever work on a corporate plantation. And my goal is for everyone that does work for someone is to get you to fire your boss before they fire you. And we need to do that because jobs are going to become scarce and more scarce because of the artificial intelligence complex we're, um, on the industry we're entering. OK. Yeah. Got anything you want to add on? Because I don't want to keep our brother too much longer. I'm just soaking all this up. Like, yeah, I, I, got, a sponge, I got a sponge all that. But I say. So, so let me ask the audience. Audience, do y'all have any questions? If you do, you can type it in your chat real quick so we can have our brother in Boy Bay clear up anything that you may be confused about. 
any questions about history, politics, not necessarily politics, but finance and organizations, and just how you can follow him. Any questions from anybody in the audience? Um, this book has been very helpful and instrumental to me, my brother and boy, I truly appreciate it. Um, things are simple, and I love that you wrote it. Like you said, you you filled in the gap for what you felt was missing. You're looking for, you know, you decided to make plain what you're looking for. I think financing and all this other stuff is um so important. And I think right now with the influx of migrants and our folks still looking at hand to mouth as the terms of um building wealth, getting money, our whole identity and psychology of money definitely has to change. So I think it's important. Our sister K fighter said, which is the best route, a trust or a will? Ha, a trust. So a you want to, you don't want to own anything, but control everything. Okay. And a trust will do that. A trust gives you, it gives you, it's, it's the jurisdiction that allow is impenetrable by any uh, judicial system because it allows you as an individual to become a a uh, a living being opposed to being a human being and if you look up the word human being or human it actually means in the black laws dictionary it means sea monster yes and one who is un, uh not allowed to own anything mm. so we call us and that's the problem is that we have not been taught how to understand the language because there's there's English and then there's there's what's called uh, legalese, and legalese right. is a legal language. And our sister K Fighter is an expert in legalese. I, I really get a lot of information from my sister. Plus my little my little stints passing in and out of their their injustice system. You know, I was one of those mm -hmm. folks who spent my time in the law library because mm -hmm. I am a reader. I love to read. I love to learn. And um, I always say, if the knowledge you have don't solve your problems. And you don't know anything. A lot of times we just like to read to say we read a book, but right. then we don't implement it. Comprehension. You know, I've, yeah. I've seen tons of elders talk about, um, you know, just all the teachers and all the lessons that are in the books. However, yeah. they don't live with it. And I'm like, all right, let's not be that contradiction, Baba or Mama. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. They, yeah. You say let's follow Dr. Sabi. You say let's follow Dr. Africa, but then you cooking up like this and this. Now I, I like fried chicken like the next person, like me personally. But you won't hear me running around citing Dr. Sabi neither. And right. that's what we talk about right. in terms of the contradictions. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a question from my brother James Bookman. Yeah. What is your thoughts on investing in the stock market during this time? Man, I would never. Um, and well, let me just, let me let me retrace that. Uh, the entire so you've heard of the saying in Vegas, the house always wins. Yes. And the stock market is just the lottery. You know what I'm saying? And it's fixed. Um, however, there are certain stocks you could invest in that, and I would say look into the tech agency, uh, tech industry. Um, you know, and also um, in the uh, hospital administration agency but i wouldn't put my shirt in there because you got to look at the history of the stock market and how it was created the stock market was created or it boomed because they got rid of pensions mm -hmm. um pensions are what our grandparents used to have where you will work for a company for some odd years and then when you retire they pay you every month until you die well, that was not a profitable thing for corporations because if the more people that stayed there, the more free money had to give out. And so that cut into their to their profit. So they created the uh, stock or they created the 401k. The 401k is what then put the onus on you to, to create your own savings, your retirement savings. And it would tell you to put it into the stock market. Well, the stock market boomed from I think it, it boomed and reached a high as far as returns for the investor around 1980. Nowadays, if you were to invest in the stock market for a period of 40 years, you're going to get a roughly average return of about 1.8% on your investment. Wow. So that's not even, or that's to, that's that's on equal par of what you would get from a savings account with a $10,000 more balance. So what I'm saying is 
if you're putting away money for 40 years or 30 years or what have you, and you're only going to get a less than 2% return, you can't retire on that, especially when you realize that inflation factors in and the cost of living will be much higher 20 years from now. So we are not aware of where to put these monies. And they tell us to put them here because when you put them there, that who does that make rich? The international bankers. So the stock market is the last place I would put my money for investment, especially if you want it to grow for you. Uh, there are other spaces where you can put it. Um, and if you do the diligence or I, you know, I'll throw my name in the hat. I'd be happy to teach you. I have a course that teaches financial literacy in this respect of where to put your investments to create uh, so you can re retire off of those uh, savings and investments. Um, I'd be happy to show you. All right. Where can um, crypto, mm -hmm. future, the yeah. news, sometimes they misinform us. Sometimes crypto is up. Sometimes it's down. What's your thoughts on crypto? And how does it fit um, in the future? Yeah, man, I'm 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 all for it. Um, you know, right now, uh, you know, we all know about Bitcoin, but there's thousands, twenty tens of thousands of other coins. But I, I work I rock with the OGs like your Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. Right. So we are in we are entering the second year of a three year uh run. So well, I'm sorry, but four year run. So what happens is we, when we look at Bitcoin, for instance which started in, I believe it was 2011, um, there's trends, there's there's history, and you got to do the history. So Bitcoin has a habit of having three good years, really good years, and then one bad year. They call that a crypto winter. So 2022 was our crypto winter. Last November, last uh, January, 2023, uh, 2023, we saw crypto drive mainly big uh, bitcoin his, which is the father of them all grandfather of them all we saw it go from it, it went up 50 percent. now as i speak right now bitcoin is at sixty two thousand dollars a coin a unit right last week it was at fifty thousand. so what we're seeing is we're seeing a push and this push is supposed to continue going for another year uh, until 2020 2026 now Bitcoin is slated to be over slated to be over a hundred thousand dollars a coin by uh, twenty thirty. Wow. Now the reason why the reason why I'm for crypto is because crypto offers a level of anonymity. It's a global coin that you can turn into any other uh, um, any other uh, dollar. Uh, I'm sorry, any other um, what do they call it again? Any kind of any other kind of um, you know, a yen, a pound, a, you know, right. a colonist. I look for like a better word. Yeah. 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 Dollar. So you can change it to whatever. But the beautiful thing about the crypto was that it appreciates in value. So if you were to have one coin and Bitcoin was at $10,000, let's just say that was like, well, that was even like in 2018, it went down to like, I think, $15,000. I'm sorry, 2020. If you had one coin is worth fifteen thousand dollars, and you still had that same coin today, it's now worth sixty-two thousand, wow. because it appreciates and and also lowers in value with the move of the market. So what am I saying? Crypto grows in value much higher in percentage. We're talking about three to four figure percentage increases, not the one point eight percent that you get from the stock market in your four hundred one k or your savings account. One point eight percent less than 2%. We're talking about 1000 plus percent in your investment in a shorter period of time. And from that, you can convert that, pull it out and use it to live off of to whatever. And it's, it's, it's global. It's anonymity. There's no KYC, no one, your customer, they got all your information. And although the government is trying to change that with the fed now, uh, bill that yeah. passed last it's July. It's trying to regulate crypto now. Yeah. Yeah. But that's an American thing. It's not as highly scrutinized around the globe. In fact, there's some places like El Salvador where their currency is Bitcoin. Their official currency is Bitcoin. So you can buy everything with Bitcoin. But here's the thing. I don't want to get crypto to buy things because it's like a piece of art. You let it grow and it appreciates in value. Now, you can loan against it, mm, meaning okay. I, can, I can pull out and still pay back the loan and get that value and it still grows as long as i pay the loan back 
but you don't want to cash out on an appreciating value or or, or a commodity because so it pretty much becomes an asset huh or an asset on my bad yeah right because now and for those who don't know assets is something that appreciates i think if they saw a baby boy the difference between guns and butter you right. know right right <laughs> things that appreciate and like your you know land you know, if you if you buy yeah. a house and, you know, it's worth this amount when you bought it and then five years from now, it should go up if you take care of it or if the neighborhood is being taken care of, it grows in value. So therefore, you can sell it if you wanted to and make a profit in your initial investment. Same thing here with crypto. The whole thing is, though, I would choose not to cash out because here's an example. There was a guy in uh, what year was it? 22, 2000, I think it was 2013 or 12. This guy decided to test out Bitcoin when it was about 83 cents a coin. 83 wow. cents. Wow. He bought 10,000. He spent 10,000 Bitcoin to buy two large Papa John pizzas. All right. So he paid more than what it was valued. But at the same time, it was crypto. So he was just thankful that someone would accept it. So Papa John's accepted 10,000 Bitcoin at 83 cents. Right. He gets the pizza. He eats it, shits it out. He's done. Right. But if... Papa John still has those 10,000 Bitcoin. Multiply that by the 62 grand a day. That's $620,000. That pizza, those two large pizzas were worth $620,000. So it, wow. it pays to hold on to it. And if you do want to pull out, you know, take it as a loan. And more importantly, what we've noticed this past week is, because people hear about Coinbase, that's the main one, is that it shut down because so many people were buying it. Because we have the habit of buying when things are high. You should buy when it's low. So because everybody saw how it was jumping up, everybody's trying to buy Bitcoin, so it crashed. The point is, is that you don't want to buy crypto. You want to get paid in crypto. That's the point. That's the discussion where you need to be at. How can I create something that pays me in crypto? So therefore, that's passive income that also appreciates in crazy um, um, percentages. So that's the, that's the conversation that I'm really trying to put our people on understand that piece because then you really can fire your boss and be your own boss and own your time and, and that boss doesn't have to be you have to have a business my my job is i learn how i live off my finances that's that's my job <laughs> i don't have to go and work and put in hours i just need to make sure that my numbers are right and that's it a couple of a couple hours a day if that and then i'm done wow dope gutter any questions you have for our brother no that's like i said i'm just soaking it up I'm, I, that that I'm 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 taking all that in. <laughs> so brother and baby, we ain't gonna hold you up too much long. I know mm -hmm. I said I only need you for about an hour, but it's been a little over an hour. But it's my pleasure, bro. It's so my pleasure. I'm glad that you know we end this on a high note, not the doom and gloom, and with a vision for the future. A lot of times we have these conversations about our position, our plight as black people slash African people in the world. A lot of times we go back to history of the doom and gloom and we always look as, as victims. But I think it's always imperative that we have a conversation about victory. I'd rather be victorious than victimized. And we have to change the paradigm of our people consciousness. And mm -hmm. this little information you gave us about crypto makes so much sense because everybody's having this conversation around us and not with us. We're still talking about policies. We're still talking about letting migrants in and jobs and, and, and things like that, that we see haven't benefited us yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, where can the people find you? Because I know you got so much other stuff going on. We didn't talk about, uh, uh self-sustaining communities outside of the U S and all of that. But again, I think I told you before, my door is always open to you. You know, you're always welcome to come back. Anything you got going on, anything you want to share, any new developments and updates, programs you got, this is your home too, brother. You know, just feel free to share, you know, just hit me and gutter up like, yo, hey. I'm going to come back to the show because I want to talk about this. I think this is important. What we're doing, me and Gutter, you know, this is an idea we came up with some times ago with our brother Doggy Diamond. Salute to him, you know, mm -hmm. because there's a particular conversation that our folks on a grassroots level need. And a lot of people, as you spoke to earlier about leadership, it's solely about grandizing their ego. It's mm -hmm. not a us, us, us. It's a me, me, me. Come to my event, buy my DVD. I don't rock with him, so you don't rock with him. Mm -hmm. And it's our community divided. Meanwhile, we see all our ops unifying and circling around us. Which so, my brother, 
about to say thank you. What you said, Gutter Brother? I said, which is weird. If you're mm -hmm. supposed to be pro black, how you anti another nigga? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just crazy. So, again, our brother and boy, tell the folks where they can find you at. Yeah, man. You can find your and how they could buy your book. Shout out to our yeah. brother, Kev Austin. Yeah, man. You can, um, you can find me on social media uh, at Mboebe Ashangi. Um, I don't know if I should put. Uh, well, they, can they see the chat? If I put it, no, they can't see the chat. Um, you can reach me at CryptoWokeMovement.com. That's C R Y P T O Woke and W O K E Movement.com. CryptoWokeMovement.com. Also, the Ghetto Times at D A G H E T T O. Tymz.com. All right. All right, brothers. So again, we thank you for joining us. We want to thank the audience for joining us. This is the relaunch of the OG Wisdom Podcast. We're going to have other guests with valuable information at our